I have insurance and so I don't need to focus on anything else other than just my physical well-being because a bike is completely replaceable and the fact that you have insurance and that you're protected and you're covered all you need to do is focus on yourself and getting yourself better like I'm gonna try and I'm gonna take risks and I'm gonna take chances because why else why would you not right I'm Alicia Speak I'm 37 I'm a full-time lawyer but I'm also a cyclist for Cycle Team London We've all noticed that British cycling has been hugely successful over the past few years. Some uh, brilliant talents through household names like Brad and Cav, of course, to uh, young upstarts like Theo Geegan Hart blowing it up at the, uh, at the Grand Tours as well. Uh, and a big reason for that, shh, 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 thank you. If you are exiting, please do so quietly because I've got some talking to do. <laughs> um, the people to thank uh, in large part for that success is British cycling. Uh, but what does it take? to actually uh, develop talent so they are standing on the podium at the likes of the 2020 Olympics in Tokyo and beyond. Here to talk about that now from British Cycling is Tom Stanton. Give him a round of applause. Good to see you, Tom. Thank you very much for having me. Let's set some context on this because your long title is Performance Pathway Manager at BC. What does that mean? What do you do? Well, I get the pleasure of uh, bringing athletes through the pathway. So I get the joy of working with 15 coaches, 180 athletes, and bringing through the next generation of Olympic champions. So it's, uh, it's a boring job. Uh, I bet it isn't a boring job. It's really satisfying. I bet it's slightly nerve-wracking this time of the year as we're looking towards uh, the summer of 2020. We'll get onto that in a minute. But how did you, how did you get into the job? So I've probably had a, a slightly odd route into this. So I was a gymnast. I was never a cyclist. And uh, when I realized that I was no longer going to be that Olympic gymnast I wanted to be, I became a coach. And through a number of very odd turns, I came to cycling and uh, became a Paralympic coach way back in 2009 and went through to the Olympic Games Home Olympics in London. Mm. Um, but just the sheer love of actually developing athletes, not necessarily going to the top, but actually taking them through that journey put me into this role of, of pathway manager where I, got, I get the, the best of the best really, which is I get to bring people and see how far we can make them travel, not just where we get to the top, but how far we can make them go as a, as a journey. I'd like to explore that idea a little bit in, in the, the British setup, not just British cycling, but the Olympic program in general is taking a different perspective from a different discipline and bringing it to another one. So look, we, we've seen swimming coaches coaching, you know, Team Sky, for example. Obviously, yeah. you come from, from a background of gymnastics. Is that a more common thing now, that you're having someone from one discipline bringing fresh eyes to the world of cycling? Yeah, I, I think it is. And the, what it does, it makes, it makes people ask questions and then think about their answers as well. So we have a lot of things that we do just because we've always done it that way, whether it's because you did it as a club rider, whether it's because we did it as a program. Every time you have someone with a completely different perspective come in, all of a sudden you ask those what we think are silly questions. Why do we do it like that? Why is that training the right training? And, and it's a really, uh, really easy way of innovating what we do. Is it a hard place to be at the moment, given the level of success, especially at the Olympics, especially on the track that Team GB has had through the late 2000s and the early part of this decade? Yeah, it is, because actually now we have an expectation to perform. And, and what we've been great at is being ahead of the curve. So through 2008, 2012, we really were... Um, away from everybody else. But the world catches up and they catch up quick. They, they've poached our staff. We had a near 90% turnover after uh, Rio because people want our intelligence. Um, and, and so what then happens is that you really want to make sure that you do that next step on. So whether that's through equipment, and I know that was, we had our new bike released here early in the week, um, through to just changing the way that we're going to operate the pathway, what we're going to focus on and what we think is going to get the riders to the next level, either quicker or better or more sustainably. Uh, have you all seen the, the track bike, the Hope Lotus bike? If you haven't seen it yet, do go and have a look at it. It looks amazing. And being a nerd for this kind of stuff, I texted Ed Clancy because obviously he's been using the promo shots. Ed, what's it like? Is it that much faster? He said, I've done about four laps on it so far, so I'm dying to have a, a, have a proper go and put it through its paces. But I guess this question is about 
the marginal gains mentality still still persists. You can see it in the seat stays and the fork of, of that bike and the fact that it's been brought out now, you know, fairly close to the Olympics for them to, to train on. Is that still a big part of what you do? It is, but it is literally that, marginal gains. And I think that without having super athletes, the marginal gains are useless anyway. And, and I think that's where we still return to doing the basics very, very well, making sure that we bring through athletes that have got all the key components that we think are necessary to become really successful. Yeah, and happy and smiling and enjoying the, uh, the experience. So let's talk about names. Let's talk about some of the young talents. I'm sure some of them we're already aware of, like the haters coming through, yeah. coming through the, uh, the system. But who else should we be keeping an eye out? Well, actually, for? to draw on the haters, they're an interesting pair because, of course, one has kind of come through our system and one, one's gone on to uh, the kind of the pro development programs. And, and that's the first uh, kind of move that we've seen in terms of we're not the only route. Um, and actually, it's, it's good that we're not the only route. We're not going to be the right thing for everybody. We are multidisciplinary. We expect track and road. And in fact, as we, we're developing, we're expecting them to, to be even more diverse than that. The, the research that, that has been done suggests that the later you can specialize, the better. Mm. So really, our philosophy is all bikes, all riding, all racing. And then at some point, we'll find the one that you're super fast at. That's really interesting because someone else who springs to mind when you say that is someone like Tom Pidcock, yeah. who you, you think, because he's, he's basically living in Belgium now and he's racing the cyclocross season and, you know, and, and doing brilliantly at that, you think there's going to be an optimum time for him to switch over to road more full time. We've seen it with someone like Mathieu van der Poel, who we all knew he was a great talent, brilliant yeah. cyclocross rider, of course, one of the best there's ever been. But this year in particular, he's had a bit more of a road focus and he's, he's achieved great things as a result. So that timing, it must be key. It is, and, and I, I suppose you could look at some of the mountain bikers like Sean Flynn, Camor, who, who whilst they're on our mountain bike program, actually they spent quite a lot of time last year racing with the under 23 road team. And, and that's where we're really lucky is that we have this wide pool of athletes. And because we're all within one roof, the profiling is the same, our testing is the same, and we can just these, these little hot spots where we go, I think you should be somewhere else for a bit. And then it's just persuading coaches to play nice and do it. <laughs> are, there, are there any sort of difficulties in having a broad brief across different cycling disciplines? Or there are, are, are there benefits of having a view of a BMXer here and a track rider here and a, and a road rider here? Well, I suppose the, the brilliant thing about it, and you use BMX to start with, is that the, the commonality between BMX and sprint is actually astoundingly yeah. close. And it has got an amazing uh, competition pathway, which Sprint in the UK doesn't. We are exceptional at it. However, underneath it, we have a void, particularly in women. Um, and so actually having BMX be so close and so accessible to us makes it um, a really rich uh, pool to, to pull from. Do you know, that brings me on to another question about using, harnessing experienced talent to bring on the next generation. You talk about BMX into track. I instantly think of Sinead Reid yeah. uh, doing that. Uh, we've talked about Ed Clancy as well. Ed, Ed's going for his... I don't know, it was 15th Olympics or something next year. He's just you know, done so many of them. Um, do you, you must call upon that talent and experience to train the next generation too. Yeah, we do. So uh, in the last year, we, uh, we had Matt Bramier start with us as our senior uh, men's coach. And it, alongside working with Ben Greenwood, who's, who's kind of our co-coach, if you like. And it's a really brilliant situation where we've got a world tour rider with bags of experience actually being in there with a coach who is arguably one of the best technical psychological coaches in the business and so we get this sweet spot where actually we can cover the 360 of developing the rider developing the person and developing the athlete as well and that's really at the core of what we do and we also though at a, at a stage in British cycling's um, development it's 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 sort of story where there is a gap where the old guard is slowly moving out of the way and I'm thinking of Ed here because again we when we were discussing this he said, I think he's 34 now going into Tokyo. The next oldest ride on the track team is going to be about 23. So there's a huge gap there. Yeah. So uh, do we need to prepare for perhaps a, a dip in the level of success while the younger riders come through the ranks? No, I don't think so. And I certainly hope not, otherwise I won't have a job. But um, it, what we see is actually is as those gaps form, 
what we're finding is we can fill them with two or three. Yeah. And that's really the sweet spot. And, and my job is really to give Ian Dyer as, as head coach and head track coach for the men's headaches. Who do I choose? Because these are all brilliant. And, and that's where we're just trying to get to all the time. And, and, and throughout the pathway, we, you know, we have riders that we always choose the best now we can. If we had 12 spaces, we could choose 12. If we had 15, we could choose 15. But of course, you know, m money and availability and just being able to manage that kind of program means that you can't always do that. So I always feel like where, where we have the riders is that we're ready, we are really lifting them in the right way. Mm. Let's go back to the start then. Let's go back to how you actually find that talent in the first place. Look, we, we heard from the Dave Rayner Fund just uh, yeah. Yeah, a couple of chats ago about they, how they encourage talent and they support it and provide a vital safety net for, for a lot of young, talented riders. Um, how do you do the same thing? Do you work in tandem with these kind of organisations these days rather than being solely focused on your own way of doing things? We do, we do. And, and in fact, our journey really starts when people um, come through the kind of the talent development pathway. So the, the guys and girls riding with for clubs and going to kind of regional races, uh, and they kind of go into that kind of uh, regional school of racing, national school of racing space. Um, and then, and then at, that's where we kind of kick in. So our foundation program typically picks anywhere between 30 and 50 riders from that space. So they're looking at kind of 15 year olds. Um, and we look at a wide range of things. It's not just whether they've been performing in terms of winning races, but when we go and watch them training, it's how they, how they train, how they interact with their coaches, how they interact with their peers. You know, we want people that actually ask questions, that can, can actually behave themselves, that can actually uh, function in a group. Um, and that's our first real kind of pluck. Um, and then we work with them for a year. We, we kind of test them, pull them, push them, see what they do at various races. And then the, this is the first kind of hit where they go to junior academy. And, and that's the first time we'll fund them as well. So at a junior academy, we give them a small level of funding, but they get a big input. So they'll have a full-time coach that kind of helps work, um, schedule them with their schooling because they're still, they're still at school. Uh, we put them into probably six weekly camps and we take them racing internationally as well. And through that two years, and, and of course there's no guarantee they can actually complete the two years, but through that two years, we see that kind of transition into what we would consider someone that's ready to move to being a full-time athlete. And, and that is a real key transition for us because going from living at home, doing this relatively part-time to making the commitment to be a full-time athlete is huge. And one of the things that we've worked very hard on in the last eight months is, is making sure that that transition is, is kind of suitable and safe and realistic and it, people can actually manage it appropriately um, because we ask them to move to Manchester and all of a sudden they're in a a dark grey environment, riding from a velodrome back home at six o'clock at night, having spent eight hours with us, and, and we know it's tough. Um, at the same time, they might go to our base in Girona and spend two weeks in the blistering sunshine, so they don't get it all bad. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to talk about how, how the approach from your end has evolved, because I'd imagine it's almost constantly evolving, uh, and it's a learning process from the occasional mistake that's been made in the past. That, the mental health of young people coming through that experience has to be key now when perhaps yeah. five, ten years ago it wasn't understood as well. And also the fairness of approach towards both boys and girls is something that is, has to be key these days. For sure. I mean, I think one of the things that we are, we're very keen on now is making sure that it's, it's their journey. And Generation Z... Uh, and we're nearly coming to the end of that now, well, it, is we can't use command and control as you could 10 or 15 years ago. You don't just give a training plan and say, crack on. Um, now it's a consultation, it's a collaboration, and that's what that generation want. And that's difficult for coaches because actually it, it's expensive. Collaboration is expensive in time, in emotion, but it does mean that you get a really good output. Um, and we've had to change the way that we, we interact as well, is that coaches are very rarely friends, and they can't be. Um, but actually what they can be is they can be far more um, uh, nascent to the fact that sometimes people aren't happy and actually we want to be in a situation where so if something's wrong that we can help change that. Um, and we've done a lot of that, we've got a lot of mental health awareness now, we have a screening process when they come on to Senior Academy and in the same way that we screen someone's physical uh, capabilities and physio and things like that is this is not to screen out, this is to make sure that we're aware. Mm. Um, and that's become a really fundamental part of what we do and something that I really believe in because mm. it just helps us to, when someone's having a moment, that actually we can say, right, how do we make this better? What do we stop for a bit? What do we pause? And then how do we get going again? Because 20 years ago, you speak to some of the, the bigger names who come through the ranks, like, like Bradley Wiggins, you'd say that the coaches were really tough. 
It was their way or the highway. Yeah. And they didn't hold back in terms of what they thought and what they said. Like you say, that just doesn't wash these days. And I guess it's an understanding that when someone's having a moment, well, everyone has a moment. Yeah. You know, even the coaches have a moment. So, I mean, I'm not saying it, it seems more touchy-feely these days, but it, more mature, I think, it, it sounds like the approach is. I think so. And, and the, th the realisation is that these guys are making a massive commitment when they join us. You know, they've had a, a, an 18-year-old has got university job, potentially cycling career. So they're making a big commitment. And now with the, pro, the, the pros being looking, developing these development teams, actually we aren't the only option. So we're very aware that we've got to make our option the best it can possibly be. Coaches still tell them off sometimes, uh, especially when we go around to the houses and they look like a bomb's hit it. Um, <laughs> or we've got mushrooms growing on the carpet like we've had previously. Um, Not healthy. Oh yeah, definitely, yeah. cultivating I think. Um, at that point, we're probably gonna say something, but actually in reality, um, these guys are super mature as they are. They've, they've already committed to this, so they're not normal 18 year olds. They are doing grown up things. Let's finish off by sort of talking about the hopes and the aspirations, the ambitions for both the, the people you look after, but those of us who are huge cycling fans and look forward to the Olympic cycle coming to fruition. As I said before, we've had massive success uh, over the past sort of uh, four or five Olympic cycles. As you look towards Tokyo, but beyond to Paris and to, to LA as well, are you optimistic that we're going to achieve the same levels of success that we've had at, uh, at Rio and, and London previously? Yeah, I mean, my job is spent looking at 24 and 28. So r almost Tokyo doesn't exist to me okay. unless I go into work and everything. So if it's rubbish, Tokyo. it's not it's nothing to no, do with No, that's nothing okay, to do with fine. me. Um, but in reality, we're setting ourselves even higher, loftier heights than that. We want to medal in every single medal that we can. Um, and that's 22 medals. So including things like mountain bike, where we've had a really long journey. You know, we've had 15 years in, in the wilderness after our racing structure collapsed. And, and, and things like BMX as well, where the likes of Kai White and, and Kyle Evans are just really kind of getting, the, getting up to their level now. And that's a really exciting time for us because, of course, what that does is it drives the interest of the sport. It also makes it more accessible to more people. And, and as soon as we, we get that kind of cohort of riders, a performance bubble that really kind of starts to lift us again, it's, it's really exciting. Can you see it this far out? Can you see it starting to take shape, this cohort, and you can see them moving off into the future and hitting those peaks at the right time? Yeah, you can. It's, it's, it's almost something that you, you, can't, um, you can't explain, but you see, and we, I've just seen this as, as they've gone through the National uh, Madison Omnium Champs, is you just have these cohorts of, of athletes who are kind of rubbing along with each other, girls and boys, and, and you suddenly realize that they're really helping each other just lift, lift, and lift. Uh, and that's really exciting because it almost makes your job negligible. You just have to push them in the right direction. Uh, and that's great because if they're smiling as well, it normally means they're enjoying it. Great. Gymnastics, a distant memory then. For now. It's all about the bike. <laughs> oh, for sure. Especially in this room. <laughs> Let's just yes. be clear about that. It's really good to hear, Tom. And look, I feel... feel Pleased that uh, Team GB and its future is in safe hands, especially as we look beyond Tokyo next year. Uh, for now, please uh, give Tom a round of applause. Uh, we're going to take just a, a very short break now, but I think after that break, uh, Matt Stevens is going to be back up here and he is going to be talking to Lachlan Morton. So stay around for that. Thanks for now. It's great stuff.